Okay, part two, second retro squad jacket for you. Um, this part got Alan talking about the run up to the Rio games and the insanely tight uh, qualification series among the GB 49ers. Uh, going on to talk about the games themselves, what it was like compared to your standard world championship. Um, and then he also gives his top picks for the 49er FX and the 49er. Take care at home and God, wish it was sailing. Absolutely perfect today. So I can't let an opportunity to chat to you go by without asking you about the Rio Olympics because it was obviously <laughs> other than the 800 nationals. Um, yeah and narrowly beating me at a top of worlds um yeah. I, the olympics is probably right up there i'd imagine in terms of your sailing achievements so yeah. let's start with the uh, qualification so qualifications for those games in the uh, 49er men's was one of the tightest qualifications yeah and it was just nail biting so uh, you secured a last minute spot so talk us through those yeah. you know those last six months up to selection Oh, last six months, it was brutal. Um, it was, yeah, it was hard. Uh, I think definitely we we're playing against John Pink and who's a great friend um, who only lives down the road from me. So, um, and he was sailing with uh, Stuart Bithell, who now sails with Dylan. They, they definitely had some legs on us with being consistent. And I think uh, we shot ourselves in the foot in Santander in 2013, a little bit where um, we finished in bronze fleet, which wasn't our proudest moment. So we kind of had to gather our things up and kind of regroup and kind of really have a look at ourselves and thought, how are we going to make this make this happen? And again, then we kind of tried to train smart, tried to learn from mistakes or what we actually learned from 2012 was still trying to develop our, our kit, um, which was sometimes the issue in the British squad was the, the selection is so, it drags out for so long that you can't actually, you're afraid to change anything. So you kind of just go out trying to do your best every time rather than change a mask or change a hull or change a set of sails um, and then go race with them. It's, it was, that period was, I think, better for us. We were happy to get the right people in to help us out. And then I think, well, the trials came down to Clearwater in Argentina. And again, that was kind of a quite nerve wracking experience going into the medal race in clear water. I think we were both, both teams were mentally tired from kind of the competition that we'd had. It was a long, it feels like a long week. And I remember going across the finishing line, finishing, thought we'd finished fourth overall and then realized Nathan, the Australian and uh, Goobs had, were over the line. And that kind of gave us the, the bronze medal. And there we kind of thought we we're back in the trials again. Before then, I think Pinky and Stu had had some upper legs on us. Um, being again, being more consistent, finishing top, I think top six. If you look back at their career, they're they're always kind of top six, top five. Um, and I guess we had, I think, uh, I think their the selection committee were looking at our results a little bit, and again, we were maybe more likely to. Um, get a medal uh, at that moment just because of our results were either a, a top three or a ten and eight um, and I think that's the again that's the only reason I think any boat could have like you said it was so tight I think any boat could have gone to that games and um, and I think we were just fortunate enough that we had put some medals under our belt mm. over that six in those six months mm. so to so tell me a little bit about the Olympics how does it compare to your standard world championships? I guess um, we had done so much sailing there from 2013 to 2016 that we were quite happy with the sailing waters. So actually the sailing around, the, the actual sailing was actually quite a nice relief to be out on the water. In terms of sailing world championship wise, because you've got less boats, I think we had 21, 21 boats or something. Boat speed becomes a lot more being a lot more important, trying to be finishing inside the top top four, top three every time. But yeah, on shore, I think was quite surreal. Sometimes you had you've got the media, so after the after the um, sailing, 
you've got to go through the media lounge. Um, but then you've also got the team support, which, well, it's great. You had Simon Hiscox, who is kind of your, looked after your boat. So if you had any issues coming in off the water, you could say, Simon, I've got um, a jib halyard or something that's fraying, or my centerboard needs a bit of love on the back edge. Um, so he would take some load off you for that. Um, and then you've got the, the physios and other support team that are kind of in the British container making you protein shakes and, and the food to kind of allow you just to race, um, which you never really get at, at world championships. You're kind of on your own and you're doing your own boat work. But as at the Olympics, you've got everyone around you at a drop of a hat who want to kind of come and help you. So that was really nice of them. And how were the courses out there? Because, I mean, one of the frustrating things was a lot of the coverage underneath Sugarloaf Mountain, which, <laughs> from what I viewed, didn't look terrible. I mean, most of the time it was just postponed when I when I tried to tune in to watch racing. I yeah. imagine that would be a very difficult course to race on. But then offshore we got a few glimpses of the Finns racing in epic conditions. Um, you know, how much of different courses did you see in the 49er? You're right there in it being postponed a lot and I think the issue with it was they couldn't launch anyone before 12 o'clock and then actually because it was their their winter or summer it meant that it, it got dark at four o'clock I think so mm. the race committee didn't have a lot of time to kind of get the racing in. Um, under the Sugarloaf you've got more of a Lake Sailors kind of mm. view how they want to race it and then you go out to the bay where you've got big, big swell out there, sometimes over 49 and mast height on one one day, I think. Wow. Um, and that that was kind of like a whole new level of trying to sail the boat where you're just trying to keep it upright where you've got the, the load of the, sw the surging the surging waves coming in, about, in and out of the boat. Um, so it kind of reminded me of a, a, a day in Pathweli at the 29 Youth World, uh, Youth Nationals. <laughs> Yeah, um, I remember. But, yeah, <laughs> but, but, but massive, but a lot bigger. Um, yeah, and then you had the, the currents in the in the harbour as well, which were, um, it was like watching an elevator. You're coming up to a tide line, a bit like at Hailing Island probably. You um, get coming up to the tide line and you're looking to see if the boat gains, if they cross that or if they lose out. And then you just see someone tack straight away. And, um, that's why I think it was great, great. We did so many hours there and we could kind of work out little game features that what we were looking for on certain courses. In the actual regatta, remember the start of the week, you had a mediocre start yeah. to the regatta, didn't you? Then you came good in the second half. <laughs> and um, yeah. wow, I was watching the medal race and I thought you were, I thought you were going to scrape Scrape the and bronze. scrape the bronze. Yeah, well. we set ourselves up for a, a bronze approach, and I think, um, yeah, I think I haven't watched that video back yet of the medal race, but I think <laughs> of the um, yeah, I think we'd coming into the the first downwind. I think we just got we we're about to go round and around the Polish, which would have put us in bronze at that moment. Um, so yeah, I think the beginning of the week. Yeah, we had a bit of a shocker. Um, we had a bit of a regroup in it, like on just before the lay day. And uh, kind of one of the coaches, Hugh Styles, took me aside and took me for some beers because he's, he's been to plenty of Olympics. He's been to, um, well, he went to the Sydney Games and um, we're good friends. We sailed with each other in the um, F-18 as well. And um, we just had some a nice little lighthearted chat and kind of actually some realisation that it's not the Olympics is, yes, it's the Olympics, but it's still a boating race. You don't need to add any more pressure to yourself and just kind of go out and rip it up, go out and enjoy it, do what you do best. Um, and that's kind of what we did. We kind of relaxed a little bit into the second half of the week and um, put some results together to kind of get us into a position where we wanted to be or could get to. And, re and regardless of the result, even though that bronze medal kind of slipped away it was uh, yeah. still an incredible achievement to be an olympian and your whole sailing career in 49ers you know well alongside dylan you know one of the top boats for for many years thanks the other thing i want to ask you about is what are you doing now what you know what sailing have you uh, or had on the calendar i should say obviously had on the calendar yeah. um i had been 
having talks with Paul Brotherton about the 505 um, world. And um, we did a little event in Hailing Island and uh, gave Ben McGrain and a run for his money um, for that event. So you, you, we... that was pretty incredible considering, I mean, how much are you weighing at the moment, if you don't mind me asking? I, that, that event, I did get up to 92 kilos. But that was only because I was trying to, there was an opportunity for the F50 grinding and I thought I'd put my name forward, but yeah. being too being too old these days, <laughs> um, I thought they, I didn't get a, I didn't get a look in at that. But um, so I was still sat at around 90 kilos for when I set up the 505 with Paul for that. So mm. I kind of wasn't far off on size. I'm just lacking a bit of height. <laughs> so yeah, that was good. We, um, finished second I think one point behind Paul uh sorry Ben yeah that was good fun again that was um myself being back on tactics and Paul helping me out a little bit and Paul being very good at the boat speed and pulling all the bits of string which there's a lot of um so that was a again a good combination trying to um do some bigger boat stuff as well so um some fast sporty sailing in the Solent yeah I'd seen some pictures of you on the um, fast sporty so tell us a little bit about that yeah, um, I think after the games where I, I really wanted to try and do some GC32 or some um, big boat stuff, fast 40s or PP52s, I just kind of spammed teams with um, my information and said I'm looking looking for something. And um, the team Jubilee came back to me and were like, yeah, we're really interested. And um, they're a little bit dubious to begin with because I didn't have much big boat or yacht experience. so. Don't sell yourself. Uh, we I've been on a been on a J one hundred five with you in the Solent when you've picked yeah. me up with a hangover from uni on the uh, on the, on the <laughs> yeah, JX's J. <laughs> yeah, I think we were both being sick off the side then, weren't we? <laughs> yeah, oh. that's not a terrible great thing to put on your CV to get on a uh, fast forty, though, is it? No, no. Uh. <laughs> All right. Well, there's one last thing I'm going to ask <laughs> of you, and yeah. this is the pick the podium for the Olympics that isn't happening this year. Yeah, oh. gold, silver and bronze in the FX and 49er. Oh, and the 49er, okay. Oh. Uh, I'm gonna have to go my Dutch girls for gold for the <laughs> FX. Um, Spanish second and Danish third. So my... second Spanish, is that uh, Tamara and... Um, Paula, yeah. Paula, yeah. yeah. Um, they just won the Worlds in Australia mm. and the Danish were third, I think, in New Zealand. Um, who else? Oh, 49ers. We go New Zealand. Obviously. Gonna win. Yeah. <laughs> this one's going to be a tight one. I think Dylan will get second and then we're going to, I'm going to say, throw it out there and be the Austrians will be third. Uh, Bill Stein and Hussel. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, it's going to be close because I think you've got the Germans and you've got my good friend Diego and yeah, Diego uh, Iago. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think they're they're they'll be ones to look out for the Spanish again. Um, they can turn it on and go pretty quick. Yeah, Diego's had quite an up and down year, hasn't he? Really, he's, he was looking absolutely fantastic mid cycle, and then he's just yeah. uh, faltered on a few events, but. Yeah. They've got some I mean, serious skills when they um, when they get into it, and a bit of a return for four, to form at the World Championships just gone. But yeah, yeah. So I think it's going to be a, the men's want to be a a good one to watch. Well, both both of them, mm -hmm. I think. But the um, yeah, who gets the? I think the Kiwis will probably seal it up. But it gets, who's going to be the the second and third yeah. for those? Oh, well, there you go. Everyone who would be betting for something that's not happening, they're uh, insider, <laughs> insider tips. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think that was everything I wanted to cover. So thank you very much for your time. I know we've all got Thanks lots of time much. at the moment, but no, yep. that, was, uh, that was fantastic.